I just received a commission with the best parameters you can imagine. And that is a landscape painting, half sheet in this colour. Oh, and the subject of flowers. Just in case you're wondering about my rules for painting a commission, take a deposit, guys. No matter what you do, it's a non-refundable deposit. What I want to do on here is create a lovely background over which I'm going to splatter. I'm wearing a magenta coloured top and it reads as very red when you put it next to magenta. If this is my black mouse, if you put it next to my black mouse, it's reading as more orange than red. So it's going to change colour depending on what it's next to. So if I want it to look really, really red, I'll include some magenta in the painting. And if you want to set off the colour, then you want the opposite colour on the colour wheel. So I've got some red and some brown. Now I really need to, something to come from the other side of the colour wheel. So uh, I'm going to get my cheap brush, reactivate this cobalt, oh, it's like sticking your brush straight into peanut butter. And I'm talking about smooth peanut butter, not crunchy peanut butter. Straight into the peanut butter and it's coming out and oh, it's so beautiful. I think cobalt must be the most favorite color of all colors. This is called shadow green. It's a whole buying color. It's a beautifully dark, dark green. Now, it doesn't live permanently on my palette, so I'm putting it in here. If I wanted it to live permanently on my palette, I would go to this little sector here where I've put gold in the past. Okay, I'm ready to splatter. Get rid of these things here. Big spray bowl. I'll move my mouse right out of the way. Big spray bottle. Generously saturating my page. Begin to imagine perhaps there'll be a lovely red one here, perhaps here, perhaps here. I'm just going to place the red wherever I feel like it. Uh, I've got masses of water there, so I'm going to be tipping shortly. This is ultramarine. Perhaps I'll put some lovely ultramarine down here, perhaps. Ultramarine, come up here a little bit. This. Is that orangey red colour from earlier? Oh, wish I knew what it was. This is definitely Daniel Smith's granulating, super granulating colour called Lunar Earth. There's like this series of colours called Lunar stuff. Lunar this, Lunar that. Oh, beautiful. I have to try and keep in mind the client's choice of colour. <laughs> Here's this beautiful green by Holbein called Shadow Green. It's a mixed colour. Uh, I'm going to put some in the foreground. Perhaps there'll be some suggestion of green marks in the foreground. Oh, oh so beautiful. The um, super granulating Lunar Earth has already done its job. I need way more of this red. So because I squeezed it a big amount out, it's so fast and easy to, to get more of it. Okay, so we're still thinking flowers here and here. Now, what I'm not going to be doing is going into existing colours. What I've got going there is beautiful. So I don't want to ruin the beautiful marks. So what I'm going to do, move those colours out of the way. And perhaps the flowers are growing up. Perhaps the flowers are growing to the side. Ah, oh, that's so beautiful. And this is the beauty of watercolour, isn't it? Look at that. That's just gorgeous. This little bit of space here is bothering me. But I, I, I yeah, right, I've just made my decision. <laughs> I've got the greens down the bottom. So I'm going to use the cobalt. And um, I do have a habit of covering every bit of the paper. I do it all the time. I just have this deep, dark desire to have um, every inch covered with colour. I totally admire paintings where they've managed not to do what I'm doing. I think I always admire painters that do what I don't do. Uh, I'm 
just tipping it both ways. Get this beautiful, beautiful wet and wet background. I'm pretty happy with that. I think I'll add a little more of the red because I'm going to do it just with a tapping method now because I'm happy with what's on here. I love the idea that I'll start off with a lovely colour base and then um, the flowers can be this colour or maybe just I'll negatively paint the flowers. Very unsure at this stage what will happen, but I'm very excited to um, paint some more. I'm just going to allow that to go everywhere. You know, the disadvantage to this lovely flicking method is it goes absolutely everywhere. A little bit ends up on my clothes, a little bit ends up on the mouse and my laptop, and I've got two cameras, so I've <laughs> A little bit ends up absolutely everywhere. There's little splatters of red on my um, laptop screen now. Anyway, so if you're going to be doing splattering, clear a big space around it because it is a little bit messy. Okay, how's that looking? The splatter is just soft and pretty. So um, if I leave it on this angle, which is flat to the table, I will get masses of backgrounds. I want to give it just a gentle angle. I just love the splatter. So if I give it a really gentle angle, then hopefully I won't lose that beautiful texture of the splatter. So I'm just going to get my masking tape and pop it underneath and see if that, that'll be enough for the paint to run down. That's good. I don't mind masses of backgrounds in my foreground, but um, the disadvantage is that you lose the beautiful, yep, and I've lost it immediately in there. Right, I think I'll do some more. This one has blue, so let's do a few colors. Back to the splatter method, put some blue down here. I quite like the idea there's blue in the foreground anyway. Okay, lovely. So this is um, drying really fast because it's a little mountain and then in the valleys there it's drying slowly. So as I splatter over here in the wet section it's just making soft marks and anywhere that's semi-dry you get a, quite a different mark. All right, that's lovely. Now let's go into the green and do the same. Oh, it's so dark. It's, it's very black. I'll put a tiny bit, tiny bit, tiny bit. Hmm, it's nice. I can add more of that later. It's just <laughs> looks like there's an absolute whirlwind now. Okay, back into my red. There's not enough red there to do the job, so more paint. That's quinacridone scarlet. And I want lots of this red. If I negatively paint these flowers, I want lots of red so I can negatively paint them. If I positively paint the flowers, then I'll have a lovely red-based background glaze over. So I can't go wrong. And I will decide whether I'm going to negatively paint them or positively paint them tomorrow. Because it's drinks o'clock as I mentioned at the beginning. And it's time for me to have a lovely relax. I've worked hard. I deserve it. And I think that background's looking really spectacular. Okay guys, I'll just clean this one off. I'm going to let that dry on this gentle angle and I'll show you what it's like in the morrow. I'm at the midpoint in this painting. Uh, the background's gone really well. I've got my little pencil that uh, I was given that has the colour that they wanted in the painting. So that's going well and I thought, so I thought why not use it why not use this pencil it's a watercolor pencil 
um, Rexil, it's a Derwent watercolour pencil, Scarlet Lake. Now, I want to use it just to sketch in a suggestion of a flower that's, um, I'm just going to do a series of ovals. Well, they're not ovals actually, they're ellipses. And then put in some little centers in the flowers. I'm going to start by playing with this transparent white. I'm going to grab a big lovely brush and start here on this edge of this flower gently as I can. Grab some of this.
I'm making progress. This next layer of is dry. I came out and had a really quick look this morning before I dashed out. And I realized that it needs more blue. In order to make this beautiful orangey color look more beautiful, it needs its complement. And I think cobalt is about as close as I'm gonna to get to a complement. So what I did was grab this little pencil, Faber-Castell Albrecht Dura Magnus watercolor pencil, and it's got this really beautiful uh, cobalt color. And I just quickly this morning, added, added, added all this little lovely little detail of blue in the center of these very orangey red flowers. And I think that's really set it off. So it's helped me decide where I'm gonna go with the middle of this um, painting. And I realized that what I need is lots of this beautiful cobalt. So I'm gonna re-wet the cobalt in here. <laughs> It rewets like such a dream. This is um, Holbein Cobalt Blue. It's a beautiful colour, quite pricey, but all cobalt is when you're paying for the beautiful version of it. I'm going to use two brushes, one just to soften off. And in fact, I might soften some of those blue marks that I made with the watercolor pencil. I do find watercolor pencil doesn't um, dissolve like I would like it to. They don't move on the page like watercolor markers or other water soluble, yeah, markers. <laughs> That's about it, isn't it? Uh, all right, so already these little bits here, um, already that little blue versus orange bit is beautiful. I'm gonna do more of that and make this beautiful red flower sing. Make little patches of intense cobalt blue come around and make the color sing. There is a book, a book on color theory called Making Color Sing. Um, I'll put a link at the end of this video to it because if you are into a bit of color theory or you've been thinking about expanding your knowledge of color theory, totally worth having a look at this book called Making Color Sing, particularly if you're um, interested in watercolor. It, uh, color theory does apply to most paints, but you can get books that specialize in your medium. And for me, my specialty is watercolor. I'm just wetting that little bit there that um, hasn't softened easily. Just make that petal go in a f funny direction. Okay. I'm just gonna go all around the flowers and add beautiful bits of intense cobalt. And I'm using two brushes because then I'm not washing off the brush with the cobalt on it. I'm just constantly using two brushes. I find it so much better. And you just dedicate one brush to be your water brush. Maybe the center of this flower can have a beautiful... I know that flowers rarely have blue centers, but when I'm painting, I'm interested in making colors look beautiful together. And that's why learning a bit of color theory can be so helpful. A lot of people certainly have their own intuitive sense of color theory so they don't ever have a desire to learn it but I found it changed my world of painting by understanding color theory anything you learn helps you doesn't it in surprising ways I'm often surprised at how pieces of information pop up in a range of ways
I can remember um, talking to an interior decorator one time who was talking about how the green makes the red look good and I can remember thinking, well that just sounds bizarre. And it, but it fascinated me, that idea that a green could make a red look good. What a fabulous uh, concept. And it was many years later before I really indulged in um, colour theory. I decided to go back to uni and, um, and one of the subjects I took was colour theory. It was one of those courses where I decided to really push myself and, and uh, get out of my comfort zone. So I took a number of classes and um, relied on the brilliance of the lecturer. So I went into colour theory and got this amazing guy who made colour theory accessible and wonderful. And I also decided I should improve my drawing skills. So colour theory went brilliantly, did brilliantly, loved all the um, exercises, did everything to um, the degree that I like to do it, which is um, I like to do something really, really well when I decide to go for it. So that went really well. But at the same time, I thought, right, I'm going to also improve my drawing skills. And so I turned, I enrolled in drawing and it was drawing for beginners because I've um, never considered myself an advanced drawer, that's for sure. And I went in with all the equipment you're supposed to bring. It wasn't a lot for drawing, of course. And um, they set up um, a subject in the middle of the room. It's weirdly, I don't remember exactly what the subject was. What I remember was <laughs> that everyone knew exactly what they were doing and um, they all just began to draw and there was no tuition. And so I managed about three lessons and thought, no, I need someone to show me what to do. I don't want to sit down and practice all by myself. I was already doing that. I'd turned up at uni to be taught. But um, you just never know what's gonna happen. Even though I was trying to push myself out of my comfort zone, you know, learn more, that kind of thing. I decided that was enough and um, took some drawing lessons locally. Funnily enough, they weren't that much better, but at least um, by then I knew a little bit more about drawing and that the reality was about drawing that you had to do it and do it again and do it and do it again and you had to keep trying. Um, and um, and I bought myself some books. So it, I learned to draw through a practice, through a combination of books and um, attending lessons. But it, I really didn't learn that much at the lessons. But it did make me draw every week. And that's the beauty of lessons. Sometimes if you don't get a good tutor, don't worry. Just keep going because once you've enrolled, you're going to be doing something that is um, going to get you there every week. And um, once you start going every week, then you'll really start to see the value in your skills building up just slowly. I'm just putting in little abstract marks everywhere, adding the blue and then softening it off with water. Add the blue, soften with water. And I'm just going to do that all over the place. A little bit more water to get a bit more cobalt. I'm using it as thickly as I can, which is not the Vegemite state, it's the creamy state. You know, when you add just a little bit of water to your um, straight out of the tube watercolour, then it's in that beautiful state that will paint 
but also will sit where you want it to. That's what I'm getting this paint to do, sit where I want it to. And that's how I'm getting those lovely th thick versions, thick, deep cobalt blue. Cobalt blue is not a really dark blue. So unless you're using it really thickly, it's never going to be particularly dark. I, this gap here is kind of bothering me a little bit, so I'm going to just include a little bit of blue and water that out as well and see if that just resolves that space there. Because it could be that I need to put something in the space. So perhaps I'll put in some... I like the idea that there's some tallish, you know, grasses or long hollyhocks or just, I'm just imagining something tall, that's better. It just does need something sometimes taken out, just putting in some suggestions of things that might start down here, a bit fatter down the bottom, and again, I'm going to soften it out over and over. Paint on, then soften for this sort of thing. And then you get a beautiful variation in mark. Okay, I think that I have um, improved this. That was uh, so needed. This blue here I added, but it's not near thick enough. So I'm just going to re-thicken some of the areas where the blue is dissipated a bit, which of course it does because I wet it. And if I'm lucky, it'll be moist enough that the blue will soften itself on some of the edges there. All right, that's better. Oh, it's so much better. That blue is just amazing and how it lifts. I think that um, I am getting really close to completion. So I've just made a video about being, how do you know if your painting is nearly completed? And one of the things that I suggest you do is take off the tape. Firstly, it's gonna stop me putting on big washers. And secondly, if my tape has done the job that I wanted it to, it's going to give it a frame and that helps it look complete. It's fascinating how frames will uh, do that. And um, then cast your eye over it. Is there somewhere where your eye goes and it bothers you? So these lines here, um, are just leading me around. I, I'm a little bit bothered by them, but um, because there's no separation between the background and the foreground, I sometimes do like a, a, a drawn mark and sometimes I don't. The shapes are good. They're nice and varied. Do I have enough tonal range? I've got lots of lovely lights, especially where I put the uh, white ink on. And then I've got some um, darks. I don't have really a real depth of dark. So that might be somewhere that I might go next. So I might, I think, still got some of this fabulous green, which really looks like a black. And then I'm going to add my cobalt to it and see what kind of a beautiful, oh, it's just shifted color. It's kind of like a beautiful Prussian blue. Now with this, no, it's not. It's, ooh, I don't know what blue you call that. But I'm going to use this brush. This is my quill. And um, it's got this fabulous point. So you can do everything with this quill. You can make light marks, heavy marks, dots, because it's got this fabulous point. So I'm just going to put in some suggestions of stamen with these dots. It's I am a little heavy-handed with this one. I could switch. 
but I mentioned earlier how I like to keep the paint on my brush and part of that is my desire to be <laughs> really <laughs> economical with the paint. So I'm unlikely to switch brushes because it's loaded on here and I hate washing it out. I know that I should not care. I know that holds me back. And I know it's what I tell students all the time <laughs> to not worry about the expense. But we all know that we are thinking about the expense. Um, I liked those little darks. I'm going to do a little bit more. I might add a little more of the green. Oh, it sent it to the greeny blue side, so that's all right. I'm going to put in some little suggestions of darks down here. I'm going to soften off with a bit of coat. Oh, no, that's just got all the dark on it. All right, just use this to soften off. Sometimes some little darks can be used just to lead your eye around. So I'll put a little dark in there. There, just some little suggestions of darks. This is on top of the ink, so it's, it's balling up a little bit there. That one. that beautiful dark, drop it in, drop, drop, drop. It's never going to sip on that white much. That's made that flower stand out more too. So if I'm coming up like that, I wonder if I can use these darks to the advantage of the composition. Make, use the darks to bring your eye around, your eye as in the viewer's eye, around the painting. Some little suggestions here and there. So hopefully it comes up like that, it comes over. Here. Up and Perhaps in next to that blue might be nice. Might make this little flower pop out a little bit, putting some here and here. And if I put it on that side of the flower, it's logical that it would be on the other side as well. Soften out, soften that bit. So I'm hopefully coming up. It needs a little bit of up there and there. Definitely wants to come high. Maybe that section. Oh, and up there. needs to come out here too, doesn't it? It's 
quite lovely what your eye does sometimes. The other thing that um, I recommend in the other video, and I'll put a link to this one as well, is that when you're getting to the end, in order to determine if you're at the end, is to take a break. You can take a photo, that helps. You can also take a break. It's really fascinating what happens if you take a little break, come back and have a little look at it later on. It's really, you get a fresh perspective. And it reminds me a lot of when I was editing documents, and which I did for years, and you regularly need to hop up wander around and then come back and go, ah, there's the mistake. If you get like a type of blindness that sets in, if you don't stop um, painting, well, if I don't stop painting, that's what happens. Everyone is completely different. And um, it certainly is about working out what works for you too. I'll put one of those over here. Go up there. More of those on it. That's quite good leading up in that way. There. Oh, yeah, that's good. That is directly following that though. So I'm going to change that as fast as I can. I need that to be maybe in blue and I don't want it to cr cross that one. I don't want it to replicate that one. So I'm making it come in a completely different angle. There, that's better. That's a bit odd too, isn't it? Dear. Okay. Break the line. Something's bothering you and it's a line, just break the line. That really helps. Oh, this flower is looking cute. Soften the edge, that one. All right, so I got up this far. I was using the black to lead up to here. I think something's needed there. soften off. Mind you, this shape is a bit yucky, so I'm not sure that has helped, but that's all right. A uh, little bit more. Oh, no, it's falling away to nothing here. That's quite nice. It's really light over there and it's a bit busier here. That's, that's quite a nice balance. I think I'll interrupt this little white bit a bit more now that it's dry. Paint's going over it a little bit. Perhaps I'll interrupt those lines a tiny bit. Put in some little suggestions of dots going up there. <laughs> it's very um, busy and like the wind is blowing everything around and I quite like that idea that I've created some um, movement in the piece. All right, I think I'm pretty pleased with that. What I'm going to do is I mentioned that I like the um, person who has commissioned me. I like to show them, I like to bring them on the journey but I also like to be in control. So if I don't like the painting, I won't show them. And um, I need a visual break from this. So what I'm going to be doing is signing it. This also helps me stop. I'm just checking it's dry enough over there. Sign it, that'll be for number one. So the second thing to do will be to take a photograph and send it to my client. I need a bit of feedback. Is this what you were thinking? Is this, a, the, does it look good? Is it along the right um, track? And uh, this is the nature of commissions. They might say no. And then I've agreed with them about how many times that I will give it a go. If I'm lucky, they like this and everything's done. They give me the other 50% of the payment. If they don't love it, and you know, sometimes I'm just gonna hold it up. Sometimes my paintings don't 
uh, translate beautifully into a photograph and they look way better as uh, in real life. So I need to make that decision. Take a photograph, send it off to her, say, what do you think? Do you like this? Am I on the right track? Or, um, and I'll think carefully about the language around that too. And um, because if I like it, I don't want to give them an option out. Um, they've paid me the 50%, we've got an agreement. Uh, you can have this painting. Uh, having said that, I'm incredibly reasonable. I really want a win-win situation. So in this situation, I will show them and if they don't love it, I'll, be, I'll say, okay, I'll give it another go. And if I've given it another go, then I'll change things to the way they might like them. And that's probably it. Um, though I'm saying probably because I change my mind about these things all the time. Anyway, uh, that's how it's looking for now. So that's pretty good. And um, it's, it's, in the, it's got the right colors that they wanted. So I'm pretty pleased about that. Uh, okay, guys, I'm gonna say that it's done for now. And please wish me good luck with the client. And I'll see you next time. And I'll put a little link at the end of this one to Making Colour Sing. And I've got another flower video, so maybe you're interested in that as well. So I'll put those two links at the end of this video in case you'd like to see something else. Thanks for all your support, guys. See ya.